Okay, so it's two past four, so why don't we make a start? Hopefully everything will be up on the screen if you need it, or at home there's the order of service if uh, something doesn't go right that you emailed this morning. Uh, hi everyone, welcome to another Sunday at Grace Church. It's lovely to be back in person again, isn't it? Lovely that the restrictions are still lifted, that we can be together, that we can sit in church, that we're going to be able to sing, we're going to be able to spend time together clap. It sounds like that great word, unrestricted. It's brilliant, isn't it? And for those of you who are new here or uh, online joining us who are new, my name is Dan. I'm the training minister. It's a real joy to have you with us. Um, as I said, everything you need is going to be on the screen or on your phones in order of service. And it's the summer holidays, so I hope everyone is resting up. Uh, if you're a student or a teacher, I hope you're getting all the sleep that you've lost in the last year. If you are not one of those... I hope you're managing to keep on going. Um, as I say often, church is the kind of place we come, no matter what week we've had, whether we've had a week where we feel spiritually strong, where we feel like we're following the Lord, that sin doesn't feel like it pushes in on us, or whether we've had a really tough week full of failings and anxieties and struggles and suffering, church the people the family of god this is the place we gather to be encouraged to be pushed forward in our christian life and to ultimately receive grace from the lord jesus church you know there are fewer of us here today there's obviously some holidays people are away church is always a special place though it's always a place where we come to receive from the lord jesus and one of the ways we do that is by confessing our need we get grace when we know how much we need it so how we're going to start we're going to take a moment of silence to prepare ourselves and then we're going to start by saying a confession prayer i've forgotten something <laughs> sorry ezra has just reminded me before we have a moment of silence, I am compelled to remind you that if you need the toilet during the service, please could you use the disabled one so we only have one to clean at the end. Thank you, Ezra. Well, we're going to have a moment of silence to prepare our hearts, maybe praying. Then we're going to say a confession prayer to start, which ends with these words. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we confess so that our spirits would be renewed and we can come and receive and worship. So let's take a moment of silence and then we'll say together. Well, the words of the confession should come up on the screen. And let's read these words together to receive grace from the Lord. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and turn from all our wickedness. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let me lead us in a prayer. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we come before you now, all with our individual experiences, with our various weeks that we've had. We come, whether strong or weak, to receive from you. We have confessed our sin. We truly are sorry for all we have done that does not honour you. But as we confess to you and admit our wrongdoing, we remember you're not a stingy or miserly God, Instead, you're a God of great mercy and grace who delights to pour out joy and mercy and love upon his people. Thank you that in Christ we have every spiritual blessing. And it's in his name we come to you now to worship and to receive from your hand the grace of your salvation. We ask this and pray to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, having received, we want to praise and glorify God. So we're going to stand and sing our first song, which is Come Praise and Glorify, a song 
declaring the grace and mercy that God has shown us. Let's stand and sing. take a seat. Well, we're going to have our kids for now. Later on, the adults will be looking at Acts chapter 14. And we're going to look at one verse of this for the kids. Paul and Barnabas are in a place called Lystra. The place is full of people who worship idols. In fact, these people, they see Paul and Barnabas do something amazing. And they worship not God. But they worship Paul and Barnabas. And Maggie is going to come up and read what Paul says to these Lystrans about what they're doing. Friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We're bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Great. Thank you so much, Maggie. Brilliant reading. Go and sit down. Paul says to these guys, they're worshipping something that's not God. What are you doing? Like, you're worshipping something that is worthless. You could be worshipping the God who made everything. Now, kids, I, to give you an idea of how stupid it is to worship something that's not God. Yeah. And when I, yes, Ezra, like it, but we haven't finished. And when I say worship, I don't mean you have to be bowing down to it. It could just be the thing you want most. If the thing you want most isn't Jesus, you could be worshipping something else. Now, to help you with this, kids, I want you to think about your house, okay? Your home. It's probably the right size. It's suitable for you. It keeps you 
dry when it rains, it's got heating, it's got the things you like in it. Now, if I was to say to you, give up your house and live in this, would anybody choose to do that? No, you wouldn't, would you? I mean, you could maybe use this as a shelter if you broke it and wore the top as a hat. But you can't fit in it. It can't keep you warm. It doesn't do anything for you. This as a house is worthless. You would never dream of giving up your home for this house. And yet these guys in this verse, and so many of us in our lives, we give up on God for something that is worthless. God could give us anything and everything. He does give us everything in giving us life with Jesus, forgiveness. He's made everything. We'll sing about that in a moment. That's what Paul says. And yet so often we say, God, I don't want the stuff you, I don't want you. I want the stuff you've given me without you. And without God, it's worthless. So kids, it's a question for us. What do you want most in your life? What's the thing you dream about? If it isn't Jesus, then it might be you're picking something worthless rather than the God who could give you everything. Maybe just think about that. What's the thing you want most? If it's not Jesus, it's not going to last. It could be a worthless thing in comparison to God. Well, I'm just going to say a prayer for us, a prayer that helps all the, the, the kids and the adults as well, just to think about this really deeply and praying that we, we treasure Jesus more than everything else. Let's say a prayer together. Heavenly Father, in our passage later, we see people who worship human beings and they worship idols. And we might look at them and think they're being silly. But Father God, if we think about our own hearts, when we think about the things that we really want, we need to confess to you that we don't often love you. We're sometimes like this, trading you for worthless things. God, you made everything. You gave us Jesus who died for us. Please help us to treasure Jesus above everything else. Help us to treasure him more than the things we want, more than the things we have. Please would we worship him rather than the things that he's made. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to stand and sing a song now. It's a song we haven't sung for ages. It's called Almighty Creator. Hearing it, I think it's pretty easy to pick up, but what do you think, Paul? Do you want to run for it or up to you? Yeah, that's okay. Let's do join it when you think you're ready. We'll do the first verse. Cool. Let's stand and sing Almighty Creator. And what's cool about this is it does not only praises God as creator, but it reminds us that we are created to worship him. Yeah. So it's been insane. Um, <laughs> Oh, 
Do take a seat. Um, it's now an opportunity for the kids to, I think, probably be going upstairs given the amount of rain we've had. Uh, so if you're year four or below, here's an opportunity for kids at four. I'll let the leaders go up first. Oh, that's a bit awkward. Cool. It's Luke and Barney. Great. Oh, do you want to go on after doing your prayer, Jack? Cool. So, kids, if you want to go upstairs, for kids at four, I'm assuming it'll be upstairs, but the leaders will take you to do what you're doing. And for the rest of us down here, the burstos are going to come and lead us in our prayers. Dear God, thank you for the skills you have, blessed, you have blessed us with and that people can show their skills in the Olympics at the moment. I also thank you for the lucky opportunity we have to show our skills and share them with others. We pray for everyone going on holiday and that they have a safe and fun time. Amen. Dear God, I thank you for our church and all the amazing people you have given us. I thank you for the summer holidays, and I pray that people still get together and spend time together. Please let us remember to pray for our church family and those outside, outside church who are struggling. Lord, please help us in the holidays to keep you at the front of our mind and keep attending church services, as it can be hard to think of you whilst we're busy doing something else. Thank you, Lord, for all the blessings you have given us. And I pray for anyone in isolation and that they can still enjoy their summer. Amen. Dear God. Thank you for the Sparkford Home and Away Camp and that it all went ahead as well as it could have done in the current times. Thank you for all the leaders that helped there and for Mark and John who came in to speak to us. Um, we pray for anyone in isolation that they can enjoy their summer holidays too. We pray for the relationships formed on this camp and for those in the church who can continue making these relationships over the holiday and that your spirit will be with us. I also pray for the wider churches and thank you for Christian companies like Christian Concern and all they're doing in your name. 
We pray for strength and courage for them and that we can support them however possible. Thank you for the blessing Dan has been to this church and I pray for you to be with him as he moves on, Lord. We pray for Dan and Chloe's wedding celebration and that it goes well next week and that it can be a time of joy for all. Thank you, Lord, that no matter what week we've had, you always forgive us and love to listen to our prayers to you. In Jesus Christ, our Lord's name. Amen. Lord, thank you so much for our church and that we can grow closer to you through sermons and fellowship together. Um, thank you for blessing us with good local church connections and that the leaders are all striving to glorify you. We pray for the SGP courses coming up and that anyone who is curious might commit that to prayer. After a challenging year, many of us feel exhausted and fragile. I pray that especially when we feel like this, that we dig into your word to build us up and refresh us. We lift up those in need around the world and especially think of the growing conflict in Afghanistan. We pray that civilians would be protected and that leaders would um, act wisely in working towards peace. Finally, Lord, we pray for those impacted by the freak weather conditions around the world, such as forest fires, floods and drought. May we as Christians be those concerned with the environment and our impact on it. Help us to be good stewards of your glorious creation. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Well, in a minute, we're going to turn to God's words. Before that we do that, we're going to sing a song, We Are Not Overcome. In the sermon later, we're going to be thinking about the idea of needing to keep going despite different relation, uh, different reactions to the gospel. I'm sure many of us have had experience that we tried to speak of Jesus, we've lived as a Christian, and yet sometimes the reaction we've received hasn't been a positive one. In fact, it's actually been quite a, an upsetting one. And yet the words of this song in the chorus, because of his great love, because of the Lord who cares for us, we are not overcome. And that's the, that'll be the theme of our passage later. So let's stand and sing, We Are Not Overcome. Flesh will pray, bones will break, peace will sing. Let me know. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you that because of your great love, we are not overcome, no matter what the circumstances of our life are. We know that the Lord Jesus reigns supreme. He has prepared a place for us with him for all eternity. And so as we engage in the mission of the gospel, as we live our lives day to day, as we come to your word now to encourage and challenge us, we know that your love for us is great and we will never be overcome as your people. Father, thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, please do take a seat. And in your Bibles, if you turn to Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6, and Abby is going to come up and read that for us. Isaiah 55, starting from verses 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth, and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper and instead of briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. Great, thank you so much, Abby. And th those verses in the Old Testament, they're really a frame for what we're going to see in our New Testament passage, which is Acts chapter 14. Sometimes uh, in the book of Acts and sometimes in our lives, we may be asking, what is God doing? Like, we're trying to spread the word, we're trying to speak of him. And yet it seems like people are often so hard, so opposed, apathetic to the gospel. And yet there we see that God in his sovereignty, his ways are not our ways. He is doing something all the time when his word goes out, either to save or to harden. As we turn to Acts chapter 14 now, we're going to see a mix of different results to the gospel being preached. So let's turn to Acts 14, starting at verse 1, and we're going to read the entire chapter together. So just give everyone a moment to turn that up. There are handouts um, that were sent on the sermon uh, on the email earlier for the sermon handout. So if you would like to take notes as you go along, please grab one of those. I'll just go take a drink of water and then we'll jump in.
Okay, so Acts chapter 14, verse 1. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There, they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there, speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among both Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders, to ill-treat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lycaon, uh, Lycaon yeah, that word, cities of Lystra and Derby, and to the surrounding country, where they continued to preach the gospel. In Lystra, there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking, and Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lysanian language, the gods had come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and reefs to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed into the crowd shouting, friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We're bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way. Yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered round him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left, left for Derby. They preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they res returned to Lystra, Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting, committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came into Pamphylia and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down uh, to Italia. From Italia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Well, please do keep that open. As we start, I'm, this may go well or may not. Kids, have any of you in a chemistry class ever done something called the Screaming Jelly Baby Experiment? I'm looking at David Guffrey. Maybe, oh, David hasn't done it. Oh, this is going to go really badly then. So in this experiment, basically, you boil a, a jelly baby in a test tube. You have um, potassium chlorate in a, in a test tube. You fry it with a Bunsen burner so it melts. And then you put a jelly baby in. And the result, you, it just kind of goes... <laughs> The reason it's called screaming is apparently the baby, the jelly baby actually sounds like it's kind of screaming. It kind of goes really colorful and it's a big bang. It's a huge reaction. When you get back to class in September, tell your science teacher, we need to do the screaming jelly baby experiment. My minister said so. When two explosive substances come together, 
in this case, the potassium chlorate and the sugar in a jelly baby, there's an explosion. There's a reaction. That's always the case. Water and potassium. Bad behavior in a strict parent. When two things that are explosive substances come together, there's always a reaction. And in our passage today, we see the same thing. On the one hand, we've got the dynamite of the good news about Jesus. And on the other hand, we've got the defensiveness of the human heart. And when those two things come together, there's a reaction. Now, over lockdown as a church, we've been so blessed to see so many positive reactions to the gospel. In September, we've got baptisms. We've had people converted. I think as a congregation, we've generally grown in our understanding and depth of the gospel. It's been a joy to see. But also, if we've been Christians for any length of time, we know that some people react very negatively to the gospel. If you like, the gospel produces explosions in people's lives. And in the book of Acts, Paul goes on three missionary journeys and he experiences the full range of reactions to the gospel. And this, cha this chapter is the end of his first journey. We've seen lots of success already in the book of Acts, but we get quite a detailed account here of some of the persecution and the division that the gospel produces. And I think Luke does that very deliberately for us. As the gospel goes out to the nations, it's not always going to be accepted well. In this passage, there's, there's opposition and there's plots from all members of society, high up and down below. There are misunderstandings that lead to Barnabas and Paul basically being worshipped as gods, which leads them to great pain. Or there might just be apathy. Some are going to believe in Christ wonderfully. We see that here, but some are going to react very negatively. And I think the main purpose of this passage for us is to encourage us and strengthen us. Because when in our lives, the general trajectory towards Jesus doesn't seem like it's positive, we're encouraged here that this is, that doesn't make our experience unusual. It doesn't mean that you're a failure if the reactions to Jesus are mixed. So let's dig in and we're going to see two responses. On the one hand, we're going to see the negative responses. That'll be the first 20 verses. And the second half, we're going to see basically those who accept Jesus and how we can encourage one another to keep on going. That second half is, is more for us. But the first point we're going to look at, the first 20 verses is this. If you've got a handout, fill it in. Speaking about Jesus will produce mixed results. Speaking about Jesus will produce mixed results. Now, I think sometimes Christians of evangelical bent can be a bit pessimistic. We can sometimes think when it comes to evangelism, we, we gravitate towards fear. We're so concerned that the culture is against us that we freeze up. But we do need to remember that verses like verse 1 of chapter 14 are in our Bibles. Look down with it at me. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went, as usual, into the Jewish synagogue. There, they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. They're in Iconium. It's an urban centre, the major city of the region. The people who live there are sophisticated. They're wealthy. It's upper class. There are a mix of cultures, a mix of races, a mix of religions. And the gospel works here. When we bring the Bible's logic to people's lives, when we bring grace, when we bring good news, people do actually believe. We've seen that in our own church. No matter how wealthy, no matter how intelligent, no matter how religious they once were, there's not a single human being alive who doesn't need the gospel. And then there's not a single human being alive whose heart is so hard that God cannot change it so that they would be restored in their soul to know Christ. So we start off with an encouragement to all of us. I mean, every person in this room is a living, breathing testimony 
if you're a Christian, that the gospel does actually work. So let's not be pessimistic, but let's be realistic. If you like, Christians are to be optimistic realists. Verse one reminds us to be optimistic, but let's look into the next 20 verses. And this is, a, this is the next little point. Speaking about Jesus will produce wide divisions. Speaking about Jesus will produce wide divisions. Look at verse two. There are those who refused to believe. Literally, they are disobedient to what they hear. And this is the explosion result, the negative damaging results. I will not believe. They're Jewish people here. That might be they don't they don't believe because Jesus is an offense to their religious kind of understanding of the world. For people in our day and age, it might not be religion, we're quite a secular culture, but it might be that Jesus tells us we can't have the things we want, and so I won't believe. Or Jesus forces me to just think a bit deeply, and so I won't believe. You know, the gospel makes people uncomfortable. It can upset people. Verse two, people may even organize to oppose the gospel. That strong image there in verse two, they poison minds against the brothers. There will be people who are divided so that they are against Jesus. And look at verse three, note, this is an irrational response. Whilst in Iconium, Paul and Barnabas, they're there for a long time, they say the same message, and God confirms the message of his grace by allowing them to produce miracles. For those of us who are interested in miracles, just note that miracles confirm the message of grace. So if there are miracles without the gospel, we need to be asking serious questions about what's going on there. But there's evidence before these Jews' eyes, there are miracles happening. Just as in Jesus' life, when he raises Lazarus from the dead, the Jews don't say, let's disprove that. They can't, they just say, let's kill him and get him out of the way. It's not a rational response. We have evidence today. We have testimony of miracles across the world. We have miraculous conversions. We have mountains of textual evidence for why the, gospel, for why the Bible is reliable. We have compelling church communities. But it isn't lack of evidence that's the problem. It's not a rational response for why people divide. Verse 4, the city is split in half. Verse 5, they even plot to destroy these messengers of the gospel. Amazingly, Jews and Gentiles and the leaders of these groups who are normally divided unite in their hatred of Christ. Why are they so irrational in the face of miracles? It's because when the gospel comes, it attacks the human heart, which builds its own kingdoms. It latches onto its own idols and it latches onto sins which it loves. We saw earlier in our kids' thought, people love exchanging God for a toy house, as long as they get to build the house. And the gospel of grace attacks this. People will divide because they hate this message of grace. For those of us who are Christians, grace is very sweet. It's wonderful to be reminded all of your sins are forgiven but if you're not a christian it's offensive because grace reminds you that you have nothing you can bring to the lord and that's a bitter pill to swallow for many that everything we built our lives upon actually often stops us from believing in christ just like a, a hard medical diagnosis is incredibly bitter and people live in denial. People do that with the gospel, even though if they were to accept the diagnosis, life-saving medicine would be available to them. See, the gospel does come in a world where it divides between those who accept the diagnosis and therefore take the medicine of grace and those who won't. And so as we look through these verses, we remember there's going to be division when we preach. There's going to be division when we live for Christ. So second, moving on to verse 8 to verse 20. 
Speaking about Jesus will produce painful misunderstandings. Speaking about Jesus will produce painful misunderstandings. Now, have you ever had an awkward moment with someone based on a misunderstanding? Maybe you've sent them a text message. I'm seeing a couple of people nod. I'd love to hear the stories. You hear a text message and you can't quite convey tone. And so you mean one thing and suddenly they take it and you've been really passive aggressive. And suddenly what was supposed to be like, I, okay, like genuinely it's okay, becomes like, what, what are you disrespecting me for or something like that? I don't know. Yeah. It's quite frustrating, isn't it? You know, you know exactly what you meant. You know, I, all I meant was okay. But suddenly things have blown up out of contr your control into a painful fight. Well, this is, what, this is the kind of thing we get in Lystra. It's a terrible misunderstanding. As Paul and Barnabas go there, they, they heal this man who's lame from birth. And you expect the gospel to flourish. Lystra is a very different place to Iconium. Iconium is this sophisticated urban mega center. Lystra is a farming town. The people there don't really go to school. They spend their entire life on the, uh, working the ground. They probably don't read. They're very rough and ready. They have their own local customs. They think the, the Greek gods, Zeus and Hermes, walked among them. It's what they genuinely believed. And so when they see Paul and Barnabas do this miracle, they don't, they don't see it as the signpost to the living God that it's hoped for. They suddenly think, oh, our gods are here with us. And Paul and Barnabas only understand what's going on when the balls are bit and the reeves are being brought out to them because they don't understand the local dialect. They meant one thing, but something else entirely has resulted from it. And verse 14, look at the reaction. When they heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting, friends, why are you doing this? Paul and Barnabas, you know, they preach Christ they live for Christ so that Christ gets the glory. But it's painful for them. It's blasphemous. That's why they're tearing their clothes to think that these people have so misunderstood them that they consider them gods. And it's equally painful because despite trying to reason with them in verse 18, look, even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. I don't know if this sort of thing has happened to you in the past. You've been chatting to someone who's not a Christian and you've been you're sharing it. They've got a problem and you've shared scriptural principles with them and you've said that you pray for them and their life's gotten better. And you go, great, they're going to be, they're going to like give Jesus a shot. And they turn around to you and say, you are wonderful. Thank you so much for that good advice. I wish I had your faith but what you've said really helped me and it kind of rends your heart because you want to say it's not me it's jesus I'm, I'm just a mouthpiece but they they walk away from jesus despite having received from him the misunderstanding well-intentioned from their side but painful for us it sticks it's not just rejection. When we speak the gospel, sometimes people are going to misunderstand us and walk away. And I think sometimes that's potentially more painful to have someone come close and then go off in a kind of misguided haze. And so what, what can we do here? Well, we're going to sit in verses 15 to 17 just for a moment. In the face of misunderstanding, there is something we can do. And here's this passage, this week's kind of presentation of the gospel. Last week, uh, John took us through Acts 13, which was all about justification by faith. Legal language, just as if you've never sinned. But Paul, when he's speaking to people who don't understand, when he's speaking to people who can't read, when he's speaking to people who don't have Bibles, he doesn't go into kind of this theological jargon. He doesn't go straight in with sin. He needs to put some building blocks in place first, because otherwise these people just wouldn't understand him. 
So Paul starts with where they are at. He starts by saying, first of all, look down. We're bringing you good news. Guys, there is good news. You might not know that. You might think that life is pointless. There is good news. He doesn't make it complicated for them. Look at what it, like, he just says, the good news is that you're following worthless things, but there's a living God that you can follow, the one who made us. So this is actually a very compelling message for people in our day and age. You know, we don't have much Bible knowledge in our society, but people do care about how they're living. If you ask people what are they building their life upon, you know, efficiency, status, money, sex, grades, people love to hear something that's going to make their life better. And when you ask them, what are you, what's the big thing you want in life? You say, is it going to last? People will suddenly see how empty the thing they're building their life upon. That everything that, if we think about it a little bit, that we build our life upon that isn't the living God, ultimately ends up letting us down. And then we say, look, here, there is a God. And he made us and he wants us and he loves us. It's an, it's an understandable but appealing message for our day and age. Maybe we have to put some basic beliefs in place for people. Verse 15, everything's been made. Like you're not an accident. There are people in our day and age who are crying out for some kind of purpose. And to have them say, you know, God made you suddenly gives their life a great deal of dignity. Only he can satisfy because he's the one who made you. People are looking for satisfaction, they're only going to find it in God. But also verse 16 and 17, if God made us, well then he has a claim on us, doesn't he? In the past we might have been allowed to go our own way, but now, you know, he's there, we can see him. Perhaps we've been allowed to walk away, but God hasn't turned his back on us. He's not left himself without testimony. And God's, uh, Paul speaks their language as he says this. He's, he doesn't use, as I said, theological jargon. He talks about rain from heaven, crops in seasons, plenty of food, stuff that these farmers are going to understand. We don't do anyone a favor by confusing them as we speak about Jesus. In the face of misunderstanding, we do our utmost to try and be understood. The gospel content that we have, the good news, that centre doesn't change, but the gospel is so flexible in the way we can present it. If I, I love this image, it's like a diamond with lots of different faces on it. And when you see a diamond from a different angle, a different face, then you get a different glimpse of its beauty. There will be people we meet in our lives who are crushed by the weight of guilt and sin, and they will need to hear about justification by faith straight away. Look, your sin can be paid for. There are some people you know who are dying for satisfaction and are craving living for worthless things. And we say, you don't have to do that because there is a God that here who made you and who can satisfy. Some people are asking, where's the justice in the world? And we say, it's coming. There is a God who has let the nations go their own way, but will bring them to account. We just try and show people the right side of the diamond so that we can make ourselves understood. But verse 18, even if we use the right side, you know, even if we get it right all the time, there are still going to be misunderstandings and we need to be prepared for that. Optimistic realists, remember? So final in the mixed reactions. Speaking about Jesus will produce dangerous persecution. Dangerous persecution. And this is just really clear from verse 19 and 20. There are some people, whether it be through stoning a Christian or through a complaining about them at work, who just want Jesus gone. And so they do this to Paul. They, uh, the Jews chase him. He once chased Christians to other cities. Now he is chased and they stone him and they think he's dead. 
He's not. He gets back up. The church encourage him. But he, he faces dangerous persecution for the gospel. There are hundreds of stories across the world nowadays of Christians in other countries who suffer physically for the gospel. There are countless throughout history. Preaching the gospel, speaking about Jesus, might lead to persecution. I know that is the thing that we have in our mind that we're all scared of. I think sometimes in our context, it may be over-exaggerated, but it is also a reality. But verses 20 and 21, just to kind of sandwich all of this kind of warning and discouragement, verse 1, many believe, verse 20, Paul goes to Derby with Barnabas, and they preach the gospel in that city, and they win a large number of disciples. See, despite the setbacks, Paul gets up, he keeps going, he keeps preaching, and in the next place he goes, many people have their lives transformed by Christ. And so in these verses, we have a realistic expectation of how people will respond to the gospel. The reason for recording this, as I've already said, is to encourage us to keep going. See, knowing that there's going to be mixed reactions means you will not be caught unawares. If you never knew you were going to be opposed, the first time you spoke to someone who didn't suddenly respond in faith, you would think, oh, actually, this doesn't work. It might devastate you. You would think that either the gospel is no good or that you are no good. And so we are warned here just to be prepared as realists. But we're also encouraged and we can be optimistic that the gospel will change people. As we come out of our lockdown, we're out of the habit, I imagine, of speaking about Christ. I imagine many of us won't have sp spoken to a non-Christian about Jesus in the last 18 months. I think that's probably quite realistic for the vast majority of us, actually. We might be out of the habit of speaking to Jesus. We may even be out of the habit of praying for people to come to Jesus, which is far more fundamental. It might be that the prospect of getting back to evangelism as normal is scary for us. And so from these verses, we want to be optimistic realists. You know, we know we may not always get good reactions as we go back to evangelism. But we're also optimistic that we will have some whose lives are changed. And it's going to take bravery. Do you notice that Paul gets up and goes back into the city after he's been stoned? If you look at verse 21, Paul and Barnabas, they return to Lystra, Iconium and Antioch, the very places they've just been persecuted. Evangelism is going to require some bravery. We're going to need to know that Christ has us. As we go back to school, as we socialize more, we might need to be brave. But we know that lives will be transformed by the gospel. And in our last few verses, we're just, and this is going to be much quicker, we just get four little ways that we can encourage one another just to be a bit braver, just to keep each other going, just to be a bit more optimistic. And the first one's in verse 22. You see, because speaking about Jesus produces mixed results, Christians are going to need to encourage each other. And so we can encourage one another, first of all, by sticking to the faith. Verse 22, sticking to the faith. You see, with mixed reactions, we may feel like we want to compromise on stuff. You know, if I'm less, like, solid on gospel issues, maybe I'll get better responses. And it might be cultural issues like gender and sexuality but perhaps more subtly and more realistically, because I think we know what the right answers to those questions are. We're more likely to say, yeah, you be true to yourself or yeah, that's what you feel. So that's true. I think we're more likely to get on board with those. Whereas the gospel tells us it is God's word. That's the authority. And instead of giving way, Paul and Barnabas go to these Christians and encourage them remain true. You encourage other Christians by remaining true. When you don't fold, other Christians see you and realize they don't have to fold. 
We all need help sticking to the faith during time. Guys, at salt, you probably feel like you want to compromise at school. Adults, you probably feel like you want to remain silent in conversations at work or with friends. Seeing other Christians sticking with it. There's no shame in struggling, but we just look at them and go, I don't have to fold. I'm under pressure, but I can remain true. So encourage one another by sticking with the faith. Verse 22, again, our second encouragement. Encourage by warning one another. Look at what Paul and Barnabas explicitly say. They've just had experience of this. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. They're just doing what Luke's been doing in this whole passage for us. He's war they're warning. If we want to enter the kingdom of heaven, living as a Christian is not always going to be easy. Sometimes we need reminding of that. Forewarned is forearmed, as they say. And knowing, you know, reminding each other, we follow a crucified saviour. We follow someone who said, take up your cross and follow me. We have a message that is life-changing, but is also dynamic and explosive in people's lives. And sometimes we just need to be gently reminded of this. Our home is in heaven, but it is a tough path to get there. There's also that encouragement. On the way to the kingdom of God, Christ walks with us. Matthew 28, he says, I will never leave you or forsake you to the end of the age. We can encourage one another by warning one another. You can even say, yeah, this sucks. Yeah, it's hard. But following Christ, we knew what we were about. Let me walk with you. Let me remind you that Christ walks with you. And remember that whatever hardships we face are preparing for us the eternal weight of glory. Third warning, encourage one another by committing one another to the Lord. Now I'm useless at DIY, like really useless. Like Chloe didn't know how bad I was when she married me. And so whenever I see any kind of little DIY job, I'm like, Ugh, this is gonna be tough. But when someone comes and does it for me, suddenly my shoulders relax. <gasps> I don't have to do this. And they're going to do a much better job than me anyway. Maybe you've had something similar, not DIY, but maybe it was a big work project. Maybe it was a tough fight or a tough conversation that you knew was coming up. And someone else came up to you and said, I'll do this for you. And suddenly you're like, oh, thank you. That's amazing. Whereas as we face mixed reactions, Paul and Barnabas, you know, they appoint elders for their churches. Look at verse 23 of me. They commit every church they, they founded to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. They know that these Christians who, you know, they're going to struggle. It's going to be difficult. But they can commit them to God and he's got it. It's what we thought about in our song earlier. Because of his great love, we are not overcome. Big job, sticking with it, speaking about Christ and mixed reactions. God's going to keep the church going. Relief is palpable, right? I mean, of course, the God who confirmed the message of his grace earlier in the chapter is going to keep his church going. Philippians 1, guys who are at home and away, you know this. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to the day of completion. We encourage one another by praying for one another and reminding one another, you know what? It's tough. God's got this. Your father in heaven is able and willing to help you. And for those we know who are consciously struggling, we pray for them and we come alongside them and help them by reminding them, yes, this is tough. I maybe don't, I can't relate, but he can. So we commit one another to the Lord. And the final one, verse 26 and 28, Barnabas and Paul come home. They come back to their church and they don't just sit on armchairs and rest. They tell everyone, they report all that God had done through them. We encourage one another by testifying to one another what God has done. This is what we're going to have at our baptisms, the testimonies of lives transformed by Christ. 
when you hear a missionary report it encourages us sometimes we just need good old-fashioned reports of what god's been doing in one another's life sometimes we just need to pick me up that yes god is working in the world if we've been rejected ourselves you know we don't want to be resentful or envious if someone's office has been suddenly converted when they mention the word Jesus, but that should encourage us. Wow, God is at work in his world. And even if it's not in my world, my sphere, where he might be involved in someone else's. And as we're involved in building his kingdom, not ours, that should encourage us to keep going. So the gospel inevitably produces mixed results. It's a bit like a jelly baby explosion. But we don't need to be blown away by the reactions we face. Instead, we're optimistic realists. We keep on speaking. We encourage one another as we go. We know that the Lord will achieve his purposes. And we commit one another to him until he returns. Let's take a moment to pray and reflect and then we're going to stand and sing the Lord's My Shepherd. Heavenly Father, thank you for the realism of your word. Thank you that you warn us. You forewarn us of the reactions we will face through the lives of Paul and Barnabas. Father, please give us the bravery that they had, knowing that though there may be different reactions to the gospel, we can be optimistic knowing that you will bring those who are yours into your kingdom. Please help us to encourage one another, particularly as we move to a different way of living, having spent the last 18 months in covid and probably not even thinking about evangelism. Father, please encourage us once again to be living missionally, to be seeking to make Jesus known at work, at school, at home. Would we encourage one another as a church? And would you continue to bless us, build us up as we seek to speak for Christ? And we ask this in his name. Amen. Well, we commit ourselves to one another, to our great shepherd in heaven, the Lord who cares for us. We're going to stand and sing the Lord's my shepherd. Thank you.
as we stand, why don't we say the words of the Lord's Prayer together? Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, forever and ever. Amen. And to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Do take a seat. And that's the end of our kind of formal time together. So uh, if we turn off the recording and I can then cut loose. Um,